went. Sweet. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for those who showed up early. I am super psyched to be joined by Jake Hare again today uh, in a, a thing we've done before, but we're casting it in a slightly different light. This is one of my favorite guests to have because it's it taps into the heart of like entrepreneurship and really, really getting started. And it's a question we get all the time because we run an application largely focused on fundraising, operating a Delaware C Corp, like getting your stuff straight, finding investors when you're ready for it. But that attracts people from every stage of the startup ecosystem. And disproportionately, a lot of people with just an idea in their head, you know, a concept of something that they want to do. Uh, and the, the concrete next steps, if you talk to me, I'm going to be like, go get a Delaware C Corp. That's what we do. But there's <laughs> <laughs> There's a concrete. It's a good idea. It is a good idea, but <laughs> of validating your idea, not wasting time. You know, gone are the days where you needed to raise a half million dollars in order to just, you know, buy server racks and things like that. Yeah. There's so much more you can do, fast and cheap and quick, to really learn if there is a there there for your company. And so, as this is the end of the year, and a lot of people are thinking about starting new stuff in January, we're focusing a bunch of our programming in November, December on that idea stage preparation of a company. So this, Jay's kind of kicking off like a series we're doing with a lot of our partners, which is all about what to get in order before you even take the plunge, before you go and like quit your job or start a company, there's a lot that you can do. And so Jake has... I don't know what you'd call like taking a an approach and sort of metastasized it into like a strategy, a data driven way to vet a startup idea. And I believe he's found tons and tons of ways that like he can almost anybody from any walk of life can really de-risk a lot of what they're doing and get a lot of early signal. So I'm going to stop talking, but I will MC any of this. Please use I'll open up the chat in the Q&A. Cool. And so throughout ask questions, uh, we'll have some time for Q&A later. Um, and I'm sure I'll interrupt Jake now and then. Uh, with fun anecdotes please do but, yeah <laughs> take it away jake thank um, you again for being here and let's get into it and there'll be some time for q a at the end i think so if you guys have questions you can drop them in the chat uh, or the q a box now uh I'll, I'll either answer them as i go or i'll answer them at the end so all good um but this presentation today is called proof before product and you'll understand why i call it proof before product in a minute or how other people like to call it how to de-risk and validate your startup idea before actually building it, uh, which is a really smart thing to do. So before I get in too far into it, who who's this guy talking right now? Um, I'm Jake. I'm the founder of Launchpeer. Uh, at Launchpeer, we basically help founders build their first product, get their first users, and secure their first checks from investors. So we're the place you go to to go from zero to one. We're not the place to get, to help you go from one to two. And I'm totally cool admitting that. <laughs> um, I'm a, you know, you have to know what you're good at, know what you're not good at. Um, so I'm a former homeless teen. I was in the army for a while, grew up in California. Uh, managed a lot of really big uh, tech products, like $100 million products for like the DOD and Fortune 500 companies uh, after I got out of the military. Uh, those are not fun projects to work on. Uh, any of you who worked with the government before, you should, you'll probably know that. Um, but uh, I'm a married father of three, live in Charleston, South Carolina, where our company is located. Uh, I'm a pretty bad surfer, although I still try. So I mean, that's all that matters, right? Um, I'm a so-so cook. Uh, I have like five meals that I typically dish out every week. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a great dad, uh, that I'll take, I'll take credit for. Um, so how did this all start? Like, how did this methodology that we're teaching start? So launch has been around for about eight years now. Uh, we actually just celebrated our eight years last month, actually. So some days it feels like we just started yesterday. Some days it feels like I've been doing this like Benjamin Button, like my entire life. Uh, but, uh, this started, um, really back then, I mean, for the first six years of Launchpeer's lifespan, we were a software development company. So entrepreneurs would come to us and say like, hey, Jake, I have an app idea. Uh, can you help me build it? You know, we'd give them a quote and they would choose to build it or not. And, you know, for custom software, for anybody who's ever tried to get an app built, those projects can be anywhere from like 25K on the very low end, all the way up to like maybe 150, 250K, maybe more than that, depending on what you're trying to do. And we would do it. I mean, that was our job. I wasn't. It wasn't my job to help founders validate their idea or raise capital or do any of that stuff. It was like, we're going to build your app and wave goodbye when you're done. But six months after, a lot of founders would come back to us and say, hey, we, we can't get any users. Like, can you help us out? Or we're running out of capital. You know, can you help us figure out, you know, how to get funding? Or this just isn't working at all. Do you know somebody who wants to help us buy this product or, you know, buy our startup from us? And I got really frustrated because it wasn't the products, you know, we, we kind of thought it was the product, like, are we just really bad at, at this? Like, <laughs> the other products we're building just awful. And that wasn't the case at all. Uh, any second time founder probably understands, like, it's it's less about the products you're building and more about uh, your ability to acquire users and customers. And we'll get into that in a second. But 
we wanted to really know why, like, why are our startups failing? You know, like what's going on? It's not the product that was going on. And so we looked at it. And if you look at the chart on the right in 2021, SBA report said that 21% of startups fail within the first year, 30% of new startups fail within their first two years. That's a lot. And if you look at just over the lifespan uh, and tech startups specifically, the average tech startup founder spends about $83,000 before their startup ends up failing of their own money. But even if it wasn't your own money, it was an investor's money. Like that's not fun either. <laughs> you never want to go to someone and be like, I mean, unless you're like the founder of FTX or something like you never want to go and be like, Hey, I topical. actually, I, I blew all of your money. I know I try to keep these pretty topical. <laughs> hey, I blew all of your money and sorry, I'll try again next time. Right? Like some people are okay with that. I am not. And most of you are probably watching this or not. We don't want to do that. So how do we avoid that from ever happening in the first place? And if you look at typical charts, like you can Google search this, like why do startups fail? Like you'll typically find a chart that looks like this. Uh, these are the reasons that startups fail. No market need ran out of cash, not the right team, out-competed. You know, we've all kind of seen things like this, like these charts. I wanted to figure out, because there's a lot of these on here that are very avoidable. I would personally think that like most of these are avoidable. Some of them are, aren't, uh, like bad timing. It's kind of hard to figure out, you know, if I'm timing the product for the market right now, although you can figure out that a little bit. But these are the reasons that startups typically fail. And at LaunchPure, our mission is to try to make sure entrepreneurship is accessible and successful for anyone. I'm married and I have kids. A lot of entrepreneurs that we work with at LaunchPure are married and have kids, or at least they have obligations, right? We're not living in a dorm room or our parents' basement or something like that. And for those of you who are doing that, I'm only speaking like this out of envy. I'm not speaking out of like <laughs> about this out of like spite. It's really just envy. Um, but a lot of us have obligations and things like that. We can't just go all in on an idea and spend a bunch of money and cross our fingers and hope it works. Or if there is an option to not do that, we should probably do that, right? I, I heard this, uh, somebody on Twitter the other day said a really good quote and it got me thinking, they said something like, VC firms and investors don't put all of their eggs in one basket either. They invest in like 10, 15, 100 startups. So why should a founder be expected to invest all of their own money into one startup. Or if you're gonna do that, at least diversify a little bit and start off small and then kind of go from there, right? Or at least test the market first, which is what we're gonna talk about today, okay? So what we do at Launch Peers, we're fully remote, we're part-time, equity-free, we're results-driven. You know, we have a proven system to do this stuff. And part of that system is what I'm gonna teach you guys today. So at Launch Peer, we have basically four steps that we go through. Proof, which is where we help you find proof of demand product where we help you build your proof of concept launch. We help you get your first customers and users, and then go out and raise capital after that. Our goal is to help our founders raise the funding they need to be able to move on from us. Cause again, we're good at going from zero to one, not so good at helping founders go from one to two, <laughs> but we know people who are really good at that. Um, but Can let's I talk about real yeah, quick. Jake, please, go ahead. We're both going to have to work on this. Uh, we do have some international people in the audience and they're asking in the chat if we speak a little slower. Oh, yeah, sure. It's going to be totally tough <laughs> for both Jake and I. We ramble. So I'm already doing it. But just to remind ourselves now and then. Thank you. Yeah, totally sorry. My bad. Uh, okay. So the system we're going to teach today is the first part of all the stuff that we teach at Launchpeer. And personally, I find it's the most important, but a lot of founders find that it's the most difficult and typically the thing that they don't want to do. Because what do, what do most founders want to do when they come up with an idea? They want to build something. I'm, I am not immune to this. Like the first thing I do when I come up with an idea is I typically buy a domain name, which is why I own like 70 domain names. Uh, I then figure out a way to build something really fast and then I launch it, right? Which is okay, sort of, if you're okay with wasting time you just think it's fun and it's a hobby, which is okay. I, I kind of think building stuff is a hobby. Um, or it's you're not going to blow a bunch of money to build it. But if you're a non-technical founder or the thing that you're trying to build is going to be kind of expensive to build, I physical products uh, startups have this issue too. Like that's a big barrier to manufacture a bunch of products and all this stuff and not know if the product is going to work, right? So the system that we came up with is a system called proof before product. And I kind of want to break down a startup into really three simple, simple components that make it very easy for everybody to understand. A startup is really three parts. It's traffic, conversions, and product. So traffic is basically 
can I consistently and reliably and measurably get people to find out that my product even exists at all, right? If I can't get in front of the right people, I could build the best product in the world, doesn't matter, okay? They'll never even know that it exists. The second part of a startup is conversions. How can I get people who know that I exist, they become aware now that I exist, how can I get them to actually want to sign up and use my product? Like what copy am I using on my landing page? What call to action am I using? How do I get them to the point where they actually get inside and get to the final step, which is they're using the tool or service or product or whatever it is to capitalize on the offer that I have presented to them throughout the process, right? And when we're looking at the process and we're breaking it down as those three things, an ideal way to make sure that your startup will be successful long-term is to make sure that you know how to generate traffic and you know how to generate conversions before you build the product, right? And I think everybody in the chat, like hopefully you guys, and drop in the chat if like you agree with this, like it would be ideal for me before I built anything, whether built anything on my own or I hired someone to build it, it would be ideal if I already knew before I built something, something how to get people to find out I exist and that I knew that they would sign up for my product before I built it. That would be great, right? Is there a way to do that? Well, yes, there is a way to do that. I want you guys to take a second and try to clear your mind. Okay? Forget everything you know about reality, about how things work online, all of it. I just want you to forget about all of it, okay? I'm gonna walk you through a very simple, uh, like mind-bending exercise, okay? Let's pretend you landed on Earth from a different planet, okay? You don't, you know nothing, okay? And you want to start a business. <laughs> this is kind of a weird thing to do. If you land on this planet, the first thing you want to do is start a business. But hey, it's okay. You start going through social media and you see an ad like this. This is an ad for HubSpot. A lot of you guys know what HubSpot is, right? You see an ad like this, very, very simple, right? Just a little bit of copy, some text above the image and some text below the image, and that's it, okay? You click on it. You go to this page and this page is, you know, pretty simple, right? It has some copy on it, some text on it. And they have this call to action right there. Start free or get a demo. Okay. Now, how do you know that that product actually exists? And again, you don't, you don't know anything about HubSpot. You never heard of it before. Like it could be anything. You just saw an ad and you see a landing page. How do you know that there's actually a product lying behind this button? You don't like you have no idea that there's a product behind that button, right? You could click on that button right there and go to a page. It's like, hey, sorry, HubSpot just isn't quite ready yet. Like when it is ready, we'll let you know that it's ready. But right now it's just not ready yet. So we know you want an account. We're just not quite there yet, right? You don't know that because HubSpot doesn't exist. I mean, it does right now, but I'll show you in a minute how this could work, right? But let's pretend that you did this for your own idea. Okay, and I'm going to show you a real world example of doing this in a second. Let's say that you decided to create an ad for your idea. Okay, really simple. Anybody can create an ad looking like this. I'll walk you through some tools in a minute of like how you guys can do this exact same thing like really fast. Okay, you create an ad, you create a landing page, you know, that talks about your product. It doesn't even really have to have any product screenshots. These definitely aren't product screenshots of HubSpot. I've been, I, I use HubSpot. This is not a. <laughs> product screenshot from HubSpot. I can tell you that nobody looks like that when they're using HubSpot. No. Um, <laughs> so you're, you know, you create a landing page that just talks about what you do, what problem you're trying to solve, like all that stuff. And then you take them to a page after they click on a button that says, Hey, sorry, we're not ready yet. But let's say that you measured all of that data. You measured to see how many people clicked on your ad. Well, first you measure to see how many people saw your ad, how many people clicked on it, how many people tried to click on the button to try to sign up for your product. What would that do for you? Well, let's walk through some examples, right? Let's say that it cost me a dollar to get someone just to visit my landing page. Okay, it cost me $1 to do, which is a pretty standard amount for like Facebook ads or something. You end up getting 50 people to click on your ad. Okay, sounds good. 10% of those people end up clicking on that button to try to sign up for your product or buy it, check out, whatever your kind of product is, it really doesn't matter, okay? And you have five, so that's five people. Five people that visited your landing page actually tried to sign up for your product. Okay, that's 10%. Cost per conversion. So the cost to get somebody to try to buy my product is $10. What does that mean to you? 
that means everything to me <laughs> because now I know when I build this thing and it's not a hundred percent, right? Like some of those people are going to drop off before they actually enter their credit card information in. they might drop off in their car and they'll abandon their car. We, I understand that. I get it. But just knowing this upfront that the cost to get somebody to take action cost me $10. I can make assumptions on the other numbers. Let's say it cost me $10 to get somebody to sign up for a free trial. For example, I know industry standard free trial to paid conversion. I can actually find that online, but let's say it's something like 5%. If I use that safe assumption, then I can do some math and say, okay, well, the cost to acquire a free trial is 10 bucks. The cost to acquire a paid subscription for my $10 a month product is you know, 100 bucks. I'm charging people 20 bucks a month. That means I'll be cash flow positive after five months or six months. It's like knowing that before I ever even build the product, how many startups do you think can actually do that? None. No startups out there can really do that. Um, most of them are like, I mean, if I capture 1% of the market, then we'll be a billion dollar company. It's like, that's not, that's not what investors want to hear, especially today when it's way harder today to raise capital than it ever has been before. Um, and also it's not something that you should be telling yourself either, because I think most founders, when they say, well, if I just capture 1% of the market, I think they know inside their head that like, it's, that sounds easier said than done. Like you still have to have a plan to capture 1% of the market, right? But this gives you that plan because if I know it costs me $10 to acquire a customer, or at least, you know, within reason, I can kind of make a, a slight assumption on that. I can walk into an investor conversation and say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Investor, if you give me $100,000, I'm going to use 50K to build the product. I'm going to use another 50K to acquire customers. When they then ask me, well, where is that going to get you? I can actually say, we ran market tests. We know that it's going to cost us somewhere around $10 to acquire a customer. If we have 50K to spend on marketing, we're going to be able to acquire... You guys can do this math on your own. Uh, Fifty thousand divided by ten dollars, which is however many customers that is, right? That's really powerful to be able to say that, right? Here's another example, right? Let's say that you ran this experiment and got these numbers, okay? Dollar per click. This is good. These are good numbers, right? But let's say that you wanted to try again, okay? Let's say you were like, you know what? I think my ad can be a little bit better. I think the way I'm phrasing my product or my offer could be a little bit better. I think. The copy I'm using on my landing page isn't that good. Or maybe I can change the design on my page to make it look a little bit better, right? Maybe I want to try charging a little bit more. Like the landing page I had said 14-day free trial and $10 a month after that. Maybe I just want to try and see 14-day free trial, maybe 50 bucks a month after that. Does that change my conversion rate at all? Or does it stay exactly the same, right? Well, you can do that with this process and it doesn't affect product at all. And you can do it within a couple of days. So now let's say you made some changes to your ad or your targeting or your audience or whatever you thought was right. You learn, and you're like, I need to target a different audience with this. Well, now it's 50 cents a click, right? Your cost per click went down in half. So now you got a hundred clicks and you spent the same amount of money. Everything else stayed the same. Conversion rate stayed the same, but now you got 10 conversions because you had a hundred clicks. And now your cost per conversion is actually $5 instead of 10, right? And I did all of that before I ever built a product, okay? One of the things that founders have a hard time doing, especially tech startup founders, how many of you guys, and you can put a note in the chat, and are like, I don't really, too. cool. I don't know how much I should charge for my product. How many of you, if you are in that phase where you're trying to figure out your business model and stuff, how many of you are feeling that way right now? Like, I have a good idea. I just don't really know how much I should charge for this thing, right? Wouldn't it be nice if all you had to do was put up a landing page, put $10 a month on there, run an ad to it, measure this stuff, turn the ad off, check and see like, okay, my cost per conversion is 10 bucks, whatever. Okay, cool. Next day, I change the pricing on the landing page and say, you know what? Let's go with 20 bucks a month. I want to see if I can charge 20 bucks a month for this. And let's say your customer acquisition cost goes from 10 bucks to 15 bucks but you doubled the cost of the monthly subscription when you ran your ads. So like I would take a higher customer acquisition cost in, in exchange for charging twice the amount for my subscription, right? And if I can find that stuff out before I ever hand the scope to a developer, because then I could tell the developer, well, I'm, I wanna charge the 14 day free trial and then 10 bucks a month after that, but that might change after. 
it's like, oh, the developers would be like, great. <laughs> I'll see you in three months. Cause like, you're going to be testing the pricing for, you know, the next year. And every time you want to do that, you're going to have to come back to us and, and tell us to change it. Cause you can't just change it yourself unless you're a developer. But instead, now you can go to the developer and say, look, I want to build this product. I know how much to charge for it. I know what features I need to build because I already tested it. I know what people want. I know how much it's going to cost me to acquire a user. I have investors lined up or I've already raised capital because I showed this data to investors. I just need to be able to take the next step. That's a really powerful thing to be able to do, right? It looks like a lot of you, like 35% of you are at that point right now, which is no other way around. Uh, Oh, it's the other way around. Two thirds do not know how much they should charge. So that's... Do you guys understand how the, like you can use this method like pretty easily to test pricing? Hopefully you guys do, but I'm going to give you guys a real world example in a second. Um, but with this method of doing this, this means that before you build your products, I already would have like, I would have the ability to build bottoms up financial projections. Okay. I'd be able to say, I know what my CAC is. I have an idea of what my lifetime and my lifetime value would be. That's the thing that you don't know. If you don't know what lifetime is, it's like, how long is somebody use my products for? So if you have a subscription, like uh, like Gus is a great example of this, right? Like I'm sure you guys measure your churn, which is related to lifetime. How long will somebody subscribe to my product for, or use my product for or whatever before they cancel their account? And then my free to pay trial, that that's kind of guesswork too. But if you go walk in and say, I at least know some of these numbers, it's going to make the prospects of you building a startup or at least investing in building the product and whether you're building it yourself, which means you're spending a lot of time doing it, or you're hiring someone to do it, which means you're spending money to do it, or even if you need to raise capital to build your product, investors are going to want to de-risk the investment as much as possible. Being able to walk in and show them bottoms up financial projections because of the numbers that you actually have in hand from data that's real, that's going to go a really long way. Okay. Um, so here is what bottoms up financials looks like. And if you don't know what bottoms up financials is, is, it just basically means that there's two ways to do financials. Okay. And I, uh, I know you guys, uh, uh, Gus, you guys have uh, Logan come in and do talks to, he's probably he's, way better at talking about. Actually, this is, that's a great thing. So for the audience, one, I'm trying to remind myself to talk slowly because we had another comment and you and I are of a similar type. I'm so bad at talking <laughs> slow. I'm sorry, guys. Plus yeah, I had like good. a, uh, I had a monster before we got on here. So it's probably a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Um, the second part in this event series that I talked about in, um, in the beginning of this is with Forecaster, which is a company who is specialized at full-on financial modeling. And I think yeah. Jake and Logan kind of blend perfectly together in terms of you know the level of forecasting that they're going to talk about and the principles behind that. That's from accountant, CFA, CPA kind of people. Mm-hmm. But this is like the beginning of you know those all those words that you just had, CAC, LTV, and whatnot. This is yeah. traction. You're going to hear all the time, what is your traction? And investors are not interested until you show traction. And it seems like ephemeral. And how can I have traction with no product? How can I, and whatever. Right. And that's like building the basis of this and then later bleeding on into a full-on financial model for bigger investment fundraising and things like that. But this is how you can go zero to one and be on the lookout for, I'll share the links and you'll get invites for the other event series too. Yeah. Carry on. And, uh, and Logan and Forecaster are partners of ours. And once our founders at Launchpeer run these experiments, right? Like the ones I just showed you, we take that data. We have our founders work with Logan and his team, plug those numbers into a financial projection, like kind of like one you see here, it's obviously more detailed than this. Um, And they actually can hand that to investors. And that's how our founders, before they build their products, are able to raise tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars in funding because, and Logan will tell you this on his presentation, even startups at series A, like usually, and Logan will say this too, most of the time startups don't start looking at financial forecasting and stuff like this until they get close to their series A. Like that's usually how it goes. And that's because at the ser- at the point of series A, it becomes a requirement to have that stuff. Prior to series A, it's not a requirement because most startups aren't good enough at getting the data necessary to be able to create those. But if you're able to have those and you can walk into an investor meeting and show an investor this stuff, it's going to put you head and shoulders above any other startups that's presenting to them. But bottoms up financial projections is really just, let me look at the smallest uh, data point that I have. And in our point of view, it would be cost for a click, a cost to get uh, somebody to convert on my site. And then that turns into my acquisition cost. How much does it cost me to 
ideally acquire a customer, right? Or a sign up or a free trial sign up or whatever. If I take that and then I just basically use that to compound on itself. So if I know it's going to cost me five dollars to acquire a customer, if I if I spend a hundred thousand dollars on marketing this year, that's going to turn into X number of customers. That's what bottoms up financial projections is. Top down which is not usually what early stage startups want to do because you have no basis for it, but it is what bigger companies do. You start from the bigger number and say, we're looking to hit $10 billion in revenue this year. Let's work from the top down and say, well, how much does each division of the company need to make? How much does each product need to make? What does that mean? How much, what's our conversion rate need to be in order for it to hit? Or how much do we need to be paying for a click in order to hit that number? And you're just basically working from the opposite end, right? Because early stage startups don't have any historical financials, it's not really the most ideal way to do it, you know? Um, but you'll be able to answer, if you do this step, you'll be able to answer questions like, do I, do I know who my ideal customer is? You know, when we have our founders do this process, we have them use paid ads to do it. And I'll talk about why we have them do that in a second. But with paid ads, one of the best parts about it is that you are able to get so drilled down on targeting that you will know 100% who your ideal customer is. Like we have our founders get to the point, and you can actually do this with Facebook, um, where I can target uh, moms between 26 and 32 who have kids between eight and 12 who live in um, you know, the middle of Nebraska uh, who shop at target who use American express cards to shop online and who've bought a product online within the last 30 days. Like I can get that specific with my targeting, which means the nice thing about this is one of the things that early stage startup founders have a hard time doing is knowing exactly who their ideal early adopter for their product is. And by using this method, you'll know that before you get in. Cause one of the big things that our founders usually learn when they start running these ads is they run the ads they don't work that well. And then they'll go back and we'll look at the data and we'll say, well, I think your audience is a little broad or you're targeting the wrong audience. Let's change the audience targeting to this audience instead, run the same ads, same page, same copy, everything kept the same. And they perform a thousand times better. They know that before they ever start building the product, which also kind of may leads to better product decisions, right? Because if I'm building a product for people who are, let's say for example, over 50, that's a much different type of product user experience that I would create than a product who's built for people who are between 18 and 30, right? Very different types of products and user experiences you want to create. Is my pricing going to work? We already talked about that. How much does it cost me to acquire a user or customer? How fast can I grow if I get funding or if I just self-fund this thing? How fast can I actually grow and where is that going to get me to, right? Um, so uh, before you move the, on to that, yeah, uh, how ahead. long... Uh, do you run these ads? That's a good question. So we typically have founders run the ads for like, usually like spending about $10 a day for two to three days. You don't need a lot of data, right? Um, obviously, the more data you get, the better. Um, but if we can get to the point where we have somewhere between 15 and 20 clicks from the ads, the data is not going to change all that much. Anybody who runs a lot of paid ads knows that like, until you start really hyperscaling, like to the point where you're spending like $50,000 a day on ads, the data is not going to change after the first couple of days. There's some things that you can do to optimize your ads, obviously. But the way I look at it here is I kind of want one tied, one hand tied behind my back when I'm doing this process. Like how many of you guys have seen um, like the Karate Kid or any, basically any fighting movie <laughs> ever made. And one of the first scenes in the movie is always like, you know, the, the trainer having the guy tie his arm behind his back or having the girl blindfold herself while they're fighting. And the trainer is always like, well, if you can fight like this, then imagine what you'll do when like you, you don't have a blindfold on or whatever. Right. And it's like, you know, it's a little cheesy, but that's kind of what we have our founders do at this stage. It's like, we don't want them to have a perfect ad. We don't want them to have like a perfect landing page or like perfect copy or anything like that. Because what we're trying to go for is if you can get numbers to work at this stage with, you know, I'm not going to say mediocre, but like a step above mediocre <laughs> material, um, then imagine what it's going to be like when 
you learn a lot more about copy or you find co-founders to bring on your team that are really good at those different areas, or you learn a lot more about your customers and what they want, or you actually have real testimonials you can put on your website, or you have like um, reviews on the app store, or you have some social proof or any of those things that you don't have right now. If you can get proof now, imagine how much better your conversion rate and stuff is going to be when you do have those things, right? Like you're going to be way ahead of the curve when it does come time to do that. So usually, and I'll talk about it in a second, because now I'm going to break down like every little individual step of doing this. And it's really, really simple. So I'll talk a little bit more about how much to spend on ads, but step one, really easy, build a proof site. Okay. Before What's we jump proof into site? the, the yeah, proof site, just because I know it's been popping up in the chat, uh, specifically with Facebook, um, have yes. you noticed changes with this approach in terms of the iOS and the, the Apple changes around no. uh, tracking and ads and whatnot? No, because at, at this stage, so let's talk about like how conversion tracking works on Facebook. Doing any sort of conversion tracking on it's Facebook especially, but it's kind of true with every ad platform. The conversion tracking that helps optimize your ads doesn't really kick in unless you have your ads running for a week and whatever conversion event you're optimizing for, like getting people to visit one page and then go to another or entering their email in somewhere or whatever, like that only starts kicking in after seven days and you have at least 50 of those conversions have happened, right? And I don't, I don't want, and we also don't need our founders to spend that much money and have the ads running that long to get enough data to say whether or not this is working. Now, me, as someone who spends thousands of dollars on Facebook ads a day, uh, like, yeah, I, I, I'm going to let Facebook optimize my ads and I'm going to do conversion tracking, all that stuff. But for us, we have our founders do very simple, just click ads, like click to website, click to landing page. That's it. So we're not really measuring conversions through Facebook. We're actually measuring conversions through the landing page builder that we use. And so what we look at is like how many unique people visited the homepage, like this one. And then how many unique people visited the page that they go to once they click a button to take advantage of whatever the offer is. I just want to compare how many unique people visited those pages. And that's how I measure conversions, you know, but we, if anything, and this is the last thing I'll say, cause I don't want to take too much time on this, <laughs> but cause I, I love nerding out on marketing stuff. Um, the, if you're thinking about advertising and I don't care if you're doing this for your startup or like maybe you work at a company right now, or you have an existing startups that's doing pretty well and you're just you know playing around with other ideas, right now is actually a great time to start running ads. And I'll tell you why. The stupidest thing that businesses do when we have economic downturns is roll back their marketing spend. You yeah, know? ads cut Which first. is crazy to me because, I mean, it's good for us and it's good for you guys listening to this because the way that Facebook and a lot of the ad platforms work is you pay based on, uh, like a bidding model. And if there's less people bidding because there's less money being spent, it means your ad costs are going to drop down significantly. We've seen over the last like month and a half, our, the, our costs, we haven't changed anything. I've literally been running the same ads on uh, Facebook for like a year and a half. It's We maybe <laughs> change an image out every couple of months, but like it's been almost the same ad the whole time. Our ad costs have got cut in half over the last couple of months versus what they were before. And you see all these tech layoffs happening. Well, if they're laying off people, they're probably also not spending money on ads, which I, again, the reason I say that's not a smart thing to do is because it's cheaper. There's less competition, which means sure. If you want to roll back spend, that's fine, but don't cut it off because if you cut it off, you're, you're not going to be making any more money. Like if you're almost just guaranteeing isn't... your future depression by preparing right. for it. And the reason businesses I think do that is because they're the people who are funded. And so it's like, well, I have this one, they're usually already unprofitable because most startups that raise a ton of capital are unprofitable. So it's like, well, what's, who cares if we lose another hundred million dollars? Like it's fine. We're already in it's the also, hole $500 million. So who cares? It's also <laughs> a lever you can pull very easily, right? If you're going to like yes. roll back on your AWS infrastructure, you're going to like pay engineers to turn things off. If you're going to try yeah. to like reduce your HubSpot account, it's like, ah, oh, we're contractually locked into that thing. I know how that goes, but it's yeah. like your Google ads thing. You can literally go in there and just be like, stop spending a hundred thousand dollars a day. Yeah. Somebody off. turn this thing off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's a lot easier than letting people go too. Right. So yeah. I can understand why they do it, but, um, uh, the first step is to build a proof site. Okay. 
if you want an example of a good proof site, um, and a good example of how this works in general, <clears throat> I should actually roll this into the presentation because it is kind of funny. Um, <laughs> if you guys want a book that talks about this entire process that you can buy right now, uh, go to proofbeforeproduct.com and you can actually buy this book. And uh, what you're going to see when you go to proofbeforeproduct.com, uh, actually go there right now because it is kind of funny, um, is a landing page for a book that I am writing. <laughs> but it's not done. Did write. Maybe, maybe not. How do you know? You don't know, right? Because like, I this whole this page looks like a landing page for a book. It says four ninety five right there. It's like I, could, it. I mean, I can get a copy right now. Like, yeah, I'll get a copy. Cool. Ah, it's not ready yet. Sorry. Like, uh, so we practice what we preach here. I'm not gonna write a book and spend all the time writing a book unless I know people actually want the book. So when it was time for me to think about writing a book about what we're talking about here, I just did exactly what I'm telling you guys to do, which is I built a landing page ran ads to it. Is it profitable? Is it not? Like, is it worth it for me to spend my time doing it? Okay, fine. I'll do it. And if you guys think this is like Jake, this crazy guy you're listening to on a Gus presentation, he does this. Like, I didn't learn this. Like, I didn't just come up with this on my own. Tim Ferriss actually does this too. Uh, Tim Ferriss, if you re read the four-hour work week and other interviews he's done, when he writes, when he's thinking about writing a book, and he did this a little bit more early on, now he just knows if he writes a book, it's going to be a bestseller. So like, whatever. But like when he was starting out, he didn't want to waste time writing a book if people didn't want it. And so what he would do is he'd come up with book topic ideas. You know, I'm, I'm sure he comes up with a million. He would create a landing page like the one you just saw. He would then run Google ads. He used Google ads to do like Google search ads. He would run ads and then he would measure how many people are clicking on this headline or this versus this headline? How many people are clicking on this book title versus this book title? Like how many people are signing up on the page to try to buy my book? Oh, that's the winner. Like, okay, I'll spend the next three months writing that book as opposed to that book that no one really ever cared about. Right. So this isn't something that is just for us. We just basically took the process and started leveraging it more for the startup space and the tech startup space in general versus writing a book. And honestly, I feel like Tim probably spends money writing a book, but like, it's not the same as building an application. Like for us, since we work with so many tech startups, it's the difference between spending 50 to 150 K building an app no one wants versus Tim Ferriss. It's like, it's the difference between spending three months of his own time writing a book or not, right? Like the risk factor isn't anywhere near the same thing. And so implementing it with a tech startup or even a physical product startup is it's going to be a much higher risk reduction than before. Right. So a proof side is just a homepage and a thank you page. One question I get about this all the time is there's an email capture form on the thank you page. Should I measure conversions in terms of how many people enter their email on this thank you page? No, <laughs> because the person already showed intent by going from the homepage to try to buy the book or sign up for your product or download your app or whatever it is that you said your call to action was, right? The call to action is basically whatever your button is on the page. They already showed intent. Now, what I am going to do is if somebody goes to this page and I say, uh-oh, you caught us too early, but they still decide to leave their email in that box, who do you think is the most excited about using your product when it actually is built? Probably that person who entered their email because you just basically lied to them and said that the product <laughs> was done and they still decide to give you their email address, which honestly happens way more often than you think. And for those of you who are like, I don't know if I want to implement this method because like, it does feel kind of like I'm lying to people. Look, I'm not asking you to take people's credit card information or I'm not even asking you to take their email address on here, right? Like that would be kind of unethical if I told you guys to do that, right? I'm also not telling you to fake testimonials on your landing pages or to fake reviews on your landing pages or fake product designs on your landing pages. All I'm saying is like, create a landing page that makes it look like your product is ready yet. If the person wants to give you their email address on the thank you page, like let them do it and be honest. Like, Hey, our product just isn't ready yet, but we'll let you know when it is. That didn't cost that person anything. Right. And honestly, I would rather let's just pretend, and this has never happened before in the years we've been teaching this. Let's say you did make one person upset. I would take one person being upset by implementing this process and being sure that I could look my wife in the face and say, babe, I need to take 50 K of our savings and build this product. I would much rather feel secure in telling her that than like not feel secure because I was afraid that one person was going to be upset that I sent them to a page and they couldn't actually get my product right now. You know, that's the way I kind of look at it. I think there's a fine line 
and this is, I mean, yeah, well-established companies do this all the time. Like you'll all be the in time. their product and you'll click a thing and it'll be like, Hey, we're working on this. Would you be interested in it? Hey, this is a feature we're thinking of exploring, yeah. like sign up for a newsletter thing. So I do think I I've in my past life, have had a product designer who was very much like, we'll, we'll take people's credit cards. And then we'll say, Ooh, the system's not processing right now. I'm like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. That right. is, that is, that's crossing a line, but there yes, is definitely is. A, a market validation thing of like, you know, Kickstarter is, I would say, a virtuous business model, right? It's people like, I want to mm-hmm. build this board game. Is there enough support out there to make it worth it? So it's a, right. it's a common thing in the post Web two world. Yes, it is. And it, this is actually a, a something that big companies do a lot. Like it's called, they call it the Wizard of Oz um, validation. And so basically, what you're doing, like Wizard of Oz, the story. Those of you who don't remember, uh, I have three kids, so I definitely remember, uh, <laughs> is there's nothing behind the curtain, right? It's just a guy, you know, like nothing, it's not real, right? And so, and sorry, spoiler alert. Shoot, <laughs> you just ruined the first <laughs> ruined movie. 80-year-old movie, <laughs> damn it. Um, so um, with this method, it's like, let's say Gust wanted to experiment with building, um, I don't know, their own financial for it. Logan, don't get mad at me their own financial forecasting application within Gust, right? The best way, one way that I'm sure Gust would experiment with this is like emailing all of you saying, we're thinking about building this. Would you want it? The problem with doing that though, is like, it doesn't really measure intent, right? You you guys like Gust. You're going to tell him what he wants to hear, or you're not going to say anything, which means he's going to be left wondering like, maybe I should build this thing. But what if instead, when you log into your Gust account next time, he had a sidebar on the left-hand side with the menu and it said new in a big shiny, you know, button. And it said financial forecasting. And when you click on it, it took you to a page that said, Hey, we're thinking about building financial forecasting. Well, again, they don't have to care at all, whether you actually enter your email to do it or not. He's going to measure those clicks. How many people are interested in using financial forecasting within gust? And that's an easy thing to measure. It's not dishonest. It's just, proving out whether or not people want this or not. Okay. So anyway, step two, create and run ads, right? This is a very simple process. This ad, you can go into Canva, which is the tool that I like to use to create anything related to design. Uh, Canva.com, C-A-N-V-A.com. It's free. I don't have an affiliate link. I should get one because I recommend this tool all the time, but Canva is great. You can basically design anything your heart desires within Canva, but it would literally take you to create an ad that looks like this maybe five minutes. Like it's super simple. Okay. Um, here, but the one, the thing I want to focus on a little bit really quick is like why paid ads. I get this question a lot. Paid ads are really fast to set up. Okay. I know it probably doesn't feel like that if you've never run them before, but like you can literally create your ads account within 10 minutes and create your ad within another 10 minutes and then launch your first ad within five minutes, like within an hour. I'm not saying they'd be great, but like it's super fast. Okay. They're measurable. Things like content, SEO, social and community, PR, they're not as measurable. Like I can turn ads on right now and within an hour, I would know how many people saw it, how many people clicked on it, uh, what device they were on, you know, where are they located at? I could see all that stuff, very measurable, okay? It's also very scalable because one of the tricks that we have our founders do is like, let's say you guys run this process. You build your landing page, you create ads, you run traffic to it, you analyze the numbers, you're like, this looks pretty good. Well, the next thing you're going to do is go build your product, right? What do you think I tell founders to do when their product is built? Do you think I tell them to like, oh, you know, you used ads to like prove this out. Now I want you to don't do that at all. I want you to go do PR instead. No, that would be crazy. Like you already figured out how to get traffic and you already figured out how to get conversions. Take the product you built, plug it in behind the landing page. You already proved work. Sure. Make a little bit of improvements to it. That's fine. But you already know that works. Why not just when people click on that home page button that said, like, for example, the book, when my book is ready, I'm just going to take down that second page, replace it with the actual checkout page. And so that way, when people click on the button on the home page, they go to the checkout page and they buy the book. I'm not going to like, oh, well, that worked well when I was trying to prove this out. Now I'm going to go do a book tour. It's like, no, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to run ads again. Like, that's super easy, right? And there's also a small learning curve. Again, I know it doesn't feel that way if you've never run ads before, but there's a the much bigger learning curve. Yeah, there's a much bigger learning curve with cold outreach because like, yeah, it sounds it sounds simple to like, I'm going to send a bunch of cold emails, but it's like, what do you think those people are going to want to do? They're going to hop on a call with you. 
Uh, do you know how to sell? Have you ever sold to someone on the phone before? Like you ever gone through four levels of bureaucracy to try to find the decision maker before? Like it's difficult. Uh, so anyway, I, that's why I like paid ads. Okay. Um, so this question, we'll have it for the Q&A more in depth. Everybody's asking about different industries, physical products, B2B, like nobody advertises yeah. B2B software on Facebook. Like that's how true. do you handle uh, those yeah. kind of startups? Yeah. So with physical products, I don't change anything at all. The only thing that I tweak is for a tech startup, it's okay to not have actual product images on your website. Like you could talk about the problem and stuff like that because they're not paying for like anything they're going to hold in their hands or wear, or put on their head or whatever, right? Like HubSpot's landing page doesn't have really any product images like real product images on it. They have images, and they have but a not product. real HubSpot <laughs> images. And they do Happy have a people. product. Um, but you can get away with that for a tech startup, right? For a physical product, you cannot, and you just can't get away with that. I'm not going to buy a pair of shoes because you say how great they are. I want to see what the shoe looks like, right? <laughs> um, so for the physical product, the only thing that we tweak is we have our founders actually go to uh, Fiverr, uh, F-I-V-E-R-R, for those of you who don't know, or Upwork. It doesn't really matter which one you use draw out a sketch of what your product will look like, um, hand it to a CAD designer, uh, CAD designer on Fiverr Upwork and say, I want you to turn this sketch into a 3D rendering of my actual physical product, okay? And there's a lot of different styles of designers on there. Pick one that works well for you. The cost is gonna be typically, I mean, this is the downside of a physical product, but honestly, trust me, this will be worth it because you're gonna need that anyway at some point. Might as well just do it now. Um, these designers are going to cost you anywhere from like 100 to 300 bucks. Okay. The more you spend, the better it's going to be. The less you spend, you know. Uh, so uh, that's the only thing that we change for physical products. For B2B, the only thing that we change for B2B is we don't have you run ads on Facebook and Instagram because that would be crazy. Like, you're right. No, no B2B offers really run on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, what we have them do instead is we have them do LinkedIn or we have them do Google search. Okay. And for LinkedIn, it's pretty straightforward. You target the people based on the job title that they have, right? Uh, or the industry that they're in or whatever. If it's Google search, we really have you target mostly one of two things, either competitors. So if I'm building a new product management software, I'll probably target monday.com. Uh, I'll probably target Basecamp or whatever, right? Uh, or we have you target more intent-based, not intent, but like lower intent-based keywords, things like... Um, best PM software for, you know, medical offices. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up, right? Like <laughs> something along those lines where it's like, okay, well, at least I know they're high intent. We like to have the order be Facebook slash Instagram first, uh, LinkedIn second, and then everything else falls in the bucket of Google search. So for those of you who are building things that are like borderline, this won't get approved on Facebook, Google, or LinkedIn. Like we had a founder recently who was building something in the uh, cannabis space. Facebook's not going to approve an ad for that. LinkedIn's not going to approve an ad for that. Google would basically approve anything. <laughs> Google doesn't care. They'll take your money for anything. So uh, we had him run Google ads and they worked really well. And then, you know, he got the proof that he needed to keep moving on. Okay. Um, hopefully they answer everybody's questions. You'd be hard pressed to tell me something that you're working on that doesn't work with ads. Because if you're going to tell me that you couldn't run ads for the product that you're thinking about building, not maybe not today, but at some point in the future, you maybe you shouldn't build that business, right? I'm not saying ads will always be the best thing that you could ever do. Like, and I, I'm not a proponent of like, ads are the only marketing strategy you should ever do. But if you can't get your offer to work with paid ads, then like, that's kind of a red flag. Because if you can't get it to work with paid ads, where it's very democratized, you can get your ad in front of the right people whenever you want. I could have my, it's one of the most democratized forms of, of marketing because I, it's the only place that I could have my ads sitting right alongside Apple and not have to pay Apple price tags to do that. If I want a billboard and Apple's competing with me on a billboard in downtown, I don't know, Austin, it's going to be expensive because I'm bidding against Apple. But a dollar per click, I'm going to be spending that just like Apple's going to be spending a dollar per click to have my ad get shown to the same person within 30 seconds. Like it's, it's, a good democratized way of doing it. You know, I also think this process is it's, it's an unsticking point for a lot of companies that have a go to market issue where it's like, yeah. how do I get, you know, into the medical community? If I don't have a huge network of doctors that I, yes. you know, a mailing list, it's like, Oh, well, if you don't have that, 
you were going to have a bigger struggle getting into a medical devising thing as a founder because you're not connected in with that community. So you have to become innovative with your go-to-market strategy, which is like, ask these questions up front. It's like, how on earth could I ever get this in front of the right people to do that rather than spending six months and billing it and being like, I built it. It will prove it. They will come and they'll just be here because my product's perfect. It's like, chances are, (laughs) if you're already independently wealthy and you can waste the time doing that, you don't have an issue with the the whole networking and the fundraising issues. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, let, let's think about it this way too. There's a lot of different ways to validate your your proof of like to validate your product, get proof of demand, all that stuff, right? You can do pre sales. Obviously, that would be great, right? I don't know many tech startups who can pre sell their products. You know, like I, I'm if somebody came to me with a great product idea and they're like, "Do you want to pre buy this thing?" I'd be like. No, just just come back to me when it's ready, bro. Like I'm not gonna, yeah, I'm not gonna buy that right now, especially right now when the economy is kind of weird, right? Well, second best is for people to, um, like, maybe customer interviews, right? Like interviewing people before you build a product. I can see that that working, but like again, that takes a, a certain level of skill because you have to read between the lines. If my friend tells me that my idea is good, they're telling me that the idea is because because it's good, or they telling me it's good because they're my friend, right? Like that doesn't validate that I have a good idea. It validates that I have really good friends, you know, <laughs> uh, or it validates that I'm talking to really nice people because they don't want to tell me my idea sucks, right? Um, or you can do pre-launch email lists, but like that doesn't show intent either because it shows that people are willing to sign up for an email list. It doesn't show that people are willing to buy a product like when it's actually ready. So this way of doing this is like the most ideal way because it it shows you all those things without having to do it. Plus I'm a little introverted and if you tell me like, yeah, go interview a hundred people about your product idea. I'd be like, I'd rather you just shoot me now. Cause like, I never want to have to do that. I'll talk to people, but like interviewing people about my idea, like that just sounds like torture to me. I'd rather show my ad to a hundred people and let them decide for me, you know? Um, so this answers one of the questions from earlier, which is step three, run three day experiments. Okay. So here, what you're going to want to do is run your ads for three days, spending somewhere around 15, 20 bucks a day. Okay. To get enough data in. And you're going to measure your click-through rate. Okay, that's how many people see your ad versus how many people click on it. You want to measure conversions, which is how many people visit that homepage uh, versus how many people actually click on the button to go to your thank you page or the oops page, like I like to call it. And then that will tell you how much does it cost me to acquire a customer. If I spend $100 on ads and I ended up having 10 people visit my second page, the page that says oops, then my assumed customer acquisition cost is going to be around ten dollars. Okay. Um, and then on the right hand side, there there are numbers that you're just going to have to assume. I don't know what your churn rate is going to be. Okay, uh, average is about twenty percent a month for some industries. Sometimes it's fifty. Sometimes it's five. Like usually, you can find information from your competitors online of like what is their churn rate. When I go to an investor and I'm telling them like this is what our numbers are, they're going to want to know what are real numbers and what are assumed numbers and how safe are those assumptions. Okay. And so one of the, some of those numbers you're going to have to assume, which is okay. As long as you're using safe, I had a founder come to me the, the other day and they showed me their numbers and I was like, yeah, their numbers looked great. And I was like, where is your LTV coming from? And they're like, well, because Facebook has a lifetime of 10 years, like that's how long somebody typically has their Facebook account. I'm building a social media app. And I thought I should use 10 years too. And I was like, no, <laughs> it's like you're not Facebook yet. Like, let's use a much safer number, please, uh, before we get get to that. His number still looked good, even though he we changed it to one year because I was like, even that's a little high. But like, let's go ahead and stick with that. But you're you're gonna have to assume some of these numbers through this process, okay? Um, and then after that, you're gonna have to think like a scientist, okay? Let's say you run an experiment for two or three days, your numbers look okay, right? It's like, eh, okay, I change up the ad copy or the audience and it's like okay numbers look okay okay then i change up like instead of having a 14 day free trial and nine bucks a month now it's a 14 day free trial and 29 bucks a month like oh the numbers look good okay it's like now i have proof and i can move on and feel confident in my decision to go ahead and build this product um and then step four iterate (laughs) uh so as you start getting numbers you're going to want to change some of the stuff about what you're doing, okay? So click-through rate, and these are just general rules. If your click-through rate, which is the percentage of people who see your ad versus click on your ad is less than 1%, Facebook and every ad platform will tell you this number. So you don't have to like do the math in your head. Like it'll tell you on there, (laughs) what's my click-through rate? If it's over 1%, you're doing pretty good, okay? 
not even we carry a 1% uh, percent rate all the time. We usually hover around 0.8 to 0.9, okay? If you can get over 1%, you're doing great. If it's under 1%, it means there's something wrong with the people that you're showing your ad to, the wrong audience, or there's something about your ad creative. You have you don't have a great enough image, you don't get enough copy, something about it is off, okay? Conversion rate. If people visiting your landing page versus the people who click on a button and go to your thank you page is less than 5%, then there's probably something off, okay? You need to change up something, right? If it's higher than 5%, then you're probably doing pretty good because a lot of businesses out there would love to have a 5% conversion rate, okay? Now, even these numbers are not entirely accurate. They're baselines because I just use our example, right? If I have a 0.8%, actually I use Gust, for example, right? If they came to me and were like, hey, our click-through rate on our ads is 0.7%, I don't think our ads are working. And then I ask like, okay, well, what's your conversion rate on your landing page and how much is it costing you to get a conversion? And they're like, oh, it's costing us $100 to get a conversion. I'm like, okay, how much does your product cost again? Oh, it costs 500 bucks or 300 bucks. I'd be like, well, there is no, don't change anything. Like, please just don't touch anything. You're spending $100 to get somebody to sign up for a $300 product. Like, let's not worry about anything else. Let's just keep moving forward, right? So these numbers kind of depend on your business model, uh, you know, how the numbers relate to each other and stuff like that. But good baseline is 1% CTR, 5% conversion rate. Okay. Um, in terms of iterating, and I know we're almost at time, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time focusing on this. Um, I actually don't mind sharing the presentation with you if you want to share it with everyone. Like, I personally don't care. Like, are you, are you yeah, cool sure. with I can, that? I can send it out with the recording um, and stuff tomorrow. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so uh, here's how you iterate, which is like, uh, you start on the outside and you work your way in. Okay. So the first thing you want to try if your ads aren't working or this experiment isn't working is like test your ad copy, test the image, test the ad platform that you're on. Sometimes Facebook isn't right. Maybe you need to move over to LinkedIn uh, and then test your targeting. Okay. If those don't work, you work in. It's like, okay, now I need to test my landing page copy. I need to test the call to action on my landing page. Maybe sign up for a free trial isn't the right like copy to use on my button. Maybe I need to change it to something like uh, incorporate your business today or something like that, right? Like it could be anything. Next, you want to test the pricing. And then after that, ideally, all of those things have worked together to the point where you've obtained proof, okay? Like proof of demand. I have proof now. I can move on and actually build the product, okay? And then that's what you do next. Once you have proof of demand, you go build the proof of concept. And then you launch. Our founders, we try to get them to the point where they've they're able to get to the point after they've built their proof proof of concept to hit 100k or to hit 1k in revenue as fast as humanly possible okay doing whatever they can possibly do running ads and doing things that are kind of unscalable right uh and then once you hit that you can either decide i want to scale this thing right uh i know how to get customers i know how to get traffic i'm going to bootstrap this thing i just want to grow you can decide to sell. Uh, there's a lot of places online nowadays where if you just get a little bit of revenue, you can go on, list your product for sale, and the multiples are pretty good. Uh, or you can go secure funding, which is what a lot of our founders decide to do. And if you have all this stuff and you've done these things, like going and raising capital, I'm not saying it's going to be easy because it's never easy to raise funding, okay? <laughs> but you will be setting yourself apart from all the other startups out there who are telling the investor 1% of a billion dollar market is, I mean, we can do that. And then- Blank stares from the investors. Uh -huh. uh, you don't want you don't want that to happen. Uh, so then you go build your product. All right. So if you want help with this, and then we'll get into the Q and A. All right. I love Gust. I love everything that you guys do. Uh, I love all their fans too. So this weekend, tomorrow, and I know it's short notice. Okay. Uh, I get that. <laughs> um, so if you can't sign up for this one, that's okay. Um, you can chat in on our website, and I'll basically do the same thing for you at the next event, which I think is going to be in December. Okay. We, we're kind of doing these once a month now, but this weekend we're doing a launch weekend. And so basically what we're doing for these three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, is we're working with founders to implement this entire process. Okay. Uh, helping them create their landing page. Uh, well, create their brand, create their landing page, uh, create their ads, um, launch their ads, look at the data, help you figure out how to measure it. Is this working? Is it not? How to fix it? All of that stuff. So this whole thing I've taught today, if you want help doing that, we're doing that during launch weekend. Tickets are $47 until tonight at midnight. But here's the catch for you guys, which is any of you who go to this link here, which is launchweekend.com slash gust. If you buy a ticket, then 
I will refund your ticket after the event is over. Grant as assuming you actually attended the event. Okay. <laughs> uh, so if you attend the event and I, I see that you're on one of the, cause I teach this, I do it myself. So like, if I see that you're on the event, I will refund you your ticket. Okay. Uh, I know it's only 47 bucks, but like the thing that's important for me and the reason we do launch weekends isn't because like, we're trying to make money from it. We only charge for it because we need people to like do it. Like I want people to do the work because the worst thing that could ever happen to the people that I work with is that they go and build something that people do not want. And I've seen it happen over and over again during the first six years of launch period where founders would pay us tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to build these products. And it's like, it was just wasted, wasted money. So if I can get you guys to not do that, that is good enough for me. So if you want a ticket, you just have to go to launchweekend.com slash gust. Yeah, I just put it in the go. chat. Okay. okay, perfect. I yeah. think that, yeah, that's um, the right one. So yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link after this too. But yeah, if you get a ticket, uh, then I'll refund you, assuming you attend the event. Okay. <laughs> so, All right, go. this will force me to send out the recording this evening <laughs> rather than tomorrow. I usually give myself 24 <laughs> hours to like clean it up. Ah, uh, sorry. I'll, I'll do that. No, no, that's actually fine. That, I, that's very generous of you. Um, <laughs> And it'll be great. And uh, I can, I will even, um, well, if anybody is here and heard this, they can tell you that, you know, they were at this event and whatnot. So yes, for sure. I mean, yep. you know, I'll, I'll know. <laughs> uh, do you have fifth? I have, I have, I do have to close down in 15 minutes, but do you have 15 extra have for some yeah. Q&A? Cool. All right. Yeah. We made it through the deck. Um, so yes, for anybody asking, I will send out an email uh, this evening with the recording link, the deck, and the the discount link uh, if you don't get in the chat or if you have to sign off before uh, we do this. And cool, let's dive into the Q&A. So we did cool. have a lot of the questions around B2B, B2C. And yeah. I think your general answer is like, there's always a way to validate. There are a few yeah. industries which you have to spend six to 12 months uh, the one specific one uh, we did get some additional questions on is what about regulated industries? Like, I guess yeah. FDA approval products are not allowed to be advertised until they actually get FDA approval. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the situations where it's like this, this situation, I, I'm not going to pretend that this would work for everything. Like there are specific cases like that one where it's like, this probably wouldn't work for that, you know? And so, you know, it's like, there are other ways to validate this because let's, let's think about this really though. Okay. What are you proving? Like, are you proving that you should build the product, or are you proving that there's a problem? So let's pretend that you presented me with an issue of like, I have this product I'm trying to get FDA approval for, and it solves this problem here. Okay. What I would probably want to do is still prove that I can generate traffic and conversions. Is there a different way for me to do that without making it product centric. So let's pretend that it was an FDA product to help you treat, uh, I don't know, like a form of dementia or something like that, right? I would want, I'm if I'm gonna build that product and I'm trying to get FDA approval for it, I'm not necessarily gonna try to generate traffic conversions from the person who has dementia, right? I'm probably trying to generate traffic conversions from the person who is close to that person who has dementia. So instead of validating the product, I can still validate the problem by creating a different asset and proving I can generate traffic conversions with that. So like in this example, I would probably create something like, I don't know, a guide or a checklist, like 10 things you can do to help your family member who is suffering with dementia or, you know, top 10 treatments for people with dementia or something like that. And that way I could still show an investor or prove to myself that I know how to get in front of the person that way, when the time does come and my product is FDA approved and I can get traffic and get conversions for the product, I already know who exactly I'm trying to get in front of. I know how to get them to sign up for something. I know the language that they want. I know the audience I'm trying to go after because the people who are going to get that guide or whatever, or ebook or whatever it ends up being like, they're going to be the same people that I'm going to try to sell this product to, right? So if I can still prove that I can get traffic and conversions, I just have to swap out the kind of product I'm offering to them when the time comes. Yes, it's not 100% ideal, but that's the only other way to do it. But I mean, the alternative to that would be building an FDA, pending FDA product in a silo. And when it does get FDA approved, like crossing your fingers and hoping that you can figure out how to get in front of the right people, right? So at least it's an option, you know? Yeah, again, like I said, I think it is 
it is very much a lateral thought experiment for go-to-market strategies because yes. most startups biggest struggling point is actually getting to market in the right way rather than just yeah. creating the innovative product. So it's worth, there's definitely going to be, and some people are putting some stuff in the chat, like, you know, there could be an area where it's really, really hard to actually take this yes. approach to it. Um, I do know there are resources for that. There are accelerators and there are industries, heavy, um, heavy cost of entries industries often have organizations that provide on ramps to them and get, get exposure and things like that. But I think yeah. for most things, it's a very worthwhile <laughs> exercise to try and be like, could I validate this without building it a thing? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you'd be hard pressed. Like this is kind of a good segue. And like, if, if you want me to prove you wrong, <laughs> buy a refundable ticket to launch weekend and I will prove you wrong during launch <laughs> weekend. Like we have, have this happen all the time because like when people join launch weekend like we have physical products and heavily regulated products and we have uh b2b and we have enterprise and it's like they i get these questions all the time like how do i do it for this thing and it's like i haven't once found a situation where we couldn't kind of slightly tweak the process to still make it work for whatever situation that they're in the one place and i do get this question a lot is marketplaces so if you're building a marketplace wow. what do what do I do? It's like, well, it's actually pretty straightforward. You do this experiment for both sides of the market. So like, let's say I was building like Uber, right? Drivers and uh, passengers, I'll call them passengers. Um, well, I would want to create a landing page and a thank you page and an ad for the specifically focused on trying to get people to become a driver. And on the other side, I'd want to create an ad, a landing page and a thank you page or oops page specifically for people who are passengers. So it's the same thing. You're just doing it for both sides in the marketplace and proving demand for both sides of the marketplace versus just doing it for one. Okay. Um, if you're the, the one caveat I have to this, and it's just dependent on the business, but we had a founder recently who had a marketplace, but one side was consumers. The other side was government. <laughs> and uh, that was a little bit tricky. So what I, what we ended up coming to a conclusion of was, and again, the, the, I'm not telling you guys this process is perfect, but like you, you can't tell me pre-launch email list signups or customer interviews or anything or, or any better than this. Um, <laughs> but uh, with him, I was like, look, when you're building a marketplace, the there's a couple ways, there's a lot of ways to build a marketplace. But one, if it's going to be really hard to get the bureaucracy, like a government on board, is there any way for you to build the first version of your product without them? Because once you get the other side of the marketplace and you start building up that demand, getting the other side of the marketplace to come on board is going to be a little bit easier. I'm not saying it's guaranteed, but it's usually a little bit easier. Like, um, so for him, he was building like an emergency disaster uh, application. And I was like, why don't we just prove demand on the consumer side? You take that data, present it to the bureaucracies, specifically the politicians, and say, look, your constituents are using this. They really want it do you want to dedicate your budget to this or not? Cause if you don't like, we're going to tell them that you're not, and that's not going to look very good for you. You know, like not as sleazy as that, but that's kind of how <laughs> politics works. Right. So uh, it's, it's kind of weird. It was a weird situation, but for him, we decided that the best thing to do would be, cause he'd already started having conversations with bureaucracies and they were already signing letters of intent, which is another good way of proving demand. Um, I was like, you already have some letters of intent, like running ads to that group is not going to work. Let's focus on building out the consumer demand and then we'll move on past that point, build out that demand enough to where you can move on and go to the governments and say, look, your constituents want this thing. Let's go ahead and do it. And the yeah. nice thing is since you built a product without them, if they do it or not, it's kind of like just an added bonus. Yeah. I mean, Gust is a great example. We wanted to always build an ecosystem connecting investment groups, accelerators, and founders. Yeah. But building a profile for founders to find fundraising. I, there's a million of these out there because people will sign up and they're absolutely garbage because there's yes. there's <laughs> investors don't want to be found. You know, they they want to be yeah. very careful. Uh, so we the build a CRM. good ones don't want to be found. Exactly. We built <laughs> yeah. a CRM for investors to just manage taking applications and investing in companies. And we ran that for five years to build up a critical mass yeah. of investors so that we could then allow entrepreneurs to fill out a profile and actually get meaningful, you know, investment applications with all the controls in place and things like that. Right. Um, and then eventually, like, we built the thing for accelerators. And now the whole network is there and the marketplace is there and it works. But it took right. it took a bit. All right, okay. One lesson that I've learned is it usually takes longer than you think it's going to. So like, always. <laughs> um, 
All right, let's get through some quick questions. Can you just uh, it, for for launch? I'll weekend, be really fast with the with the answers right. this time. So, <laughs> uh, for launch weekend, can somebody join Saturday and Sunday, but not Friday, and still get value out of it? Yeah, totally cool. We we have all the replay and the recordings up. One of the things that you do is get access to our community and all the replay in there. You get support after the event is over. So, like, we have a lot of people who buy a ticket. They know they can't attend, but they really want to get the content and they just watch the replays after the sessions are over and they still get support the week, the weeks after the event is over oh, cool. uh, from our team because they're just in our community now. So it's fine. Can you just give us a super quick rundown of what's sort of included in the weekend? Yeah. So we have, uh, I think it's, we have a session on Friday night um, where we focus on just the high level principles of what I talked about here uh, in a little bit more detail. And then um we start building your brand. So like how to build a brand for less than 10 bucks, basically like your logo, all that stuff. Saturday morning, we focus on building the landing page. And then in between that session and Saturday night session, uh, you have the homework of like working on your landing page. We give you the template though. So like, you don't have to build it from scratch. You just duplicate our template and then change the copy and the imagery. Um, Saturday night, we do a Q and a, which is optional. And then Sunday session, which is in the afternoon, we teach you how to create your ads, run those ads. And then once that session is over throughout the next week or two, uh, we basically are like working with you in the community. Like you get your ad stats, you drop it in the community. You tell us like, Oh, you know, this is my stats. Like, are these good? Are they not good? Like I'm having this issue, whatever. And it's just kind of support after that one big perk that I, I should probably say this in the beginning, but one big perk that you get as part of doing this is like, once you join launch weekend, you're a launch peer startup. Okay. Even though I'm going to refund you your ticket price, but you're a launch peer startup now, uh, which means since we're a GAN accelerator, if you know what GAN is, GAN is global accelerator global network. Accelerator. Yeah. Um, it's basically like a way for accelerators who are good at what they do, you know, no, we're pretty good at what we do, uh, to share <laughs> resources amongst themselves. But one of the things that GAN accelerators have is because we have a lot of leverage, we have a perks program that has over a million dollars in perks and discounts to basically any tool or ever imagine in any category. So if you join launch weekend, one of the things that we give to you, if you attend is access to that perks platform forever, which means like, you know, you come for a weekend, I'm giving you, I'm good. I'm basically giving you a million dollars. So like, and I'm refunding you your 47 bucks. So you're kind of insane if you don't get a ticket. So, you know, <laughs> see, look, no you offense. can be a salesman ish. <laughs> I you you know. just have to sell with a uh, conviction rather than. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's true. All right. Thank you so much for that. So what else do we have? Uh, we had a question earlier on. Does this method, this is interesting. Does this method work if you don't have any idea who your first customers are? Oh, that's a good question. When it's very general. Um, yeah, we actually will help you with that. So one of the things that we talk about, and it's on the Friday night session, is how to turn your idea into an offer. And I'm so glad you asked that question because like, that's the question that every founder should ask. Because I think the big thing, the big problem that a lot of founders have when they start out is they have that problem you just said, but they don't realize it. Yeah, um, they think they know. Say like, who's your product for? It's like people who can drive. It's like, you got to give me more than that, you know, <laughs> like, come on. And it has to be like, when you get to the point where you feel like it's too specific, you're probably just right, you know? And I had a founder who was building a, um, uh, what is it called? Like a telemedicine application recently. And he was having a really hard time with his ads and his landing page and stuff. I was like, well, who's your app for? And I went to the landing page and it was like, tell it, you know, get a hold of a doctor. And I was like, it's too broad. And he's like, I was like, I'm going to do an experiment with you. And so what I did was I went and looked in to see how many women between 40 and 50 are having gastrointestinal issues, like in the United States. And that sounds really ultra specific, right? But when we did the numbers based on how much he was trying to charge, he could instead change his offer to be, we're a telemedicine application that matches women between 40 and 50 with the best uh, gastrointestinal gastrointestinal doctors in the United States. You can change your offer to that. And there are millions of women <laughs> in the United States who are dealing with that and no platform that's specifically directed to them. Based on his pricing model, he would be a $120 million business if he captured like 2% of that market. And he doesn't have to stop there. Like he could take part of that market and then expand out to other parts of the market. That's like one example of like, you, you should get so specific to the point where if one of your ideal customers is looking at your landing page or looking at your ad, they're kind of creeped out that like, 
are they are they are they following me like are they listening to my alexa device or <laughs> are they tapping into my phone like how do they know that like this is me if you can do that you're going to be able to compete with a lot of big companies because most big companies really suck at paid ads like they're yep. awful at it so like this is a big competitive advantage if you do it so well and they also need to move huge numbers that like you know yeah right and they're spending yeah they can't be niche anymore but you can yeah. so you that's should. always the, the startup way right. uh this one is out of my depth but maybe you know what these acronyms mean a gis software like esri can be used oh, to i worked validate. in i was in the military so uh i know what gis <laughs> is what was the last part of the question uh, esri can be okay, used yeah. to validate the market as well how do they Esri, respond to yeah. your data or first something like esri yeah i mean um if you're talking about using that kind of uh information to validate an idea like sure yeah i mean if you're talking about validating an idea well, that can you tell is us what gis those, or as oh what, those mean? what are <laughs> what are gis and esri so yeah. it's basically like mapping software so like i can't remember what gis stands for but it's like uh, uh g it's basically like you guys ever go to like a Google maps and it like, it actually maps the topological, mm -hmm. um, like plane, you know, where you can like see in 3d and stuff. Ah, it's geospatial basically what, information system. Yeah. There you go. There geospatial you go. information system. So, um, <laughs> it's like mapping different places in the planet. So I, I, it was 10 years ago since I was in the military. It's been a while. Um, but, uh, can you validate something like that? Yes. It sounds B2B. Uh, so I'd probably focus on LinkedIn or Google. If you're using that, using that data to validate, proof of demand, I'd probably have to do a little bit more research on how you would do that. But like, it, I mean, it kind of makes sense if you talk about depending on the kind of product you're building, like, do, do I think people would want to travel to this location? Or do I th think what people would want to do this thing over here? It's like, sure, you can do that. The, the bottom line for me is like, I'm a huge fan of not using guesswork to do anything. <laughs> um, which is why it's really hard for me to stomach doing SEO because it takes me so long to get results that I don't know if it's working or not. So to me, it feels like it's going to be six months of guesswork until I start ranking for keywords, right? Um, I'm a huge fan of seeing data almost in real time. Like, so I'm a big proponent for startups to use paid ads. And also I am a big proponent of startups using cold outreach if they learn how to do sales, because I can go with ads and say, I spent a hundred bucks, got a hundred clicks, got, you know, this CTR, got this click through rate, got this conversion rate, like, and I can do something about it based on which number is not good. Cold outreach. If I reach out to hundred people, I get X open rate. I get, you know, X number of replies. I get, you know, I can look at those numbers and say like, I need to improve this. Those kind of methods. I'm a huge fan of, especially early on because part of being a startup is you have very little resources. So I can't waste my time on stuff that's not working. I need to double down on the stuff that is working and really quickly fix the stuff that's not before I run out of resources. And so if GIS or Esri, those kind of tools let you do that, I'm kind of all for it. You know. Now I actually remember, because I used to, I worked in the military 10 years ago as well. I worked for uh, Boeing actually, but we contracted a lot. Oh, cool. We used yeah. GIS in one of the the top secret stuff we worked on. And I think maybe the nature of this question is, you know, he asks how do investors respond to this data or something like that. Any oh, large oh, collections of data sources are great for your pitch deck when great. you eventually want to say how big is the total addressable market. But yeah. traction speaks volumes over anything. Right. You could say there's millions of women with gastrointestinal issues and whatever, and they might take your word for it, or they might be an investor that knows about that stuff. But if you say, and I have a hundred of them knocking down my door to like get access to the service, that right. means everything more <laughs> than, you know, just the fact that there's some data out there that says something. Yeah, very true. I couldn't agree more. Uh, we have one question about, um, do you help people evaluate ads versus competitors to improve? Yeah, um, one of the things that we do, and I'll leave you guys with this uh, trick, because I think you said you had to leave it. Uh, I, I got uh, myself 15. another 15 minutes if if you do as oh, well. Just I do too. So cool. Right. Um, but uh, one of the places that I would go is um, Facebook uh, ad library. So this was created around like 2017 or something, like after the whole fake news and all that stuff. Like Facebook wanted to be more transparent about who was advertising their platform and what exactly they were advertising with. So um, if you go to Facebook, if you just Google search Facebook ads library, you can go to all ads and then you can go in here and search 
any brand on here. So I can go in here and search um, HubSpot, for example, right? Uh, and I can see every single ad that HubSpot is running now and all the ads that they've run in the past. So like, these are all the ads that HubSpot is running right now, okay? Now, here's the thing that I will also impress upon you. Most of HubSpot's ads are total trash. So <laughs> don't, don't always use it as a framework of like, oh, I should do this. You know, use it as more inspiration. Like what kind of things could I use? Like what kind of copy can I use? What kind of imagery can I use and stuff like that? Um, that's what I would use it for. Because the other thing that you have to remember too is HubSpot might not be doing ads for cold traffic. So a lot of brands, what they'll do, and a lot of you probably visited e-commerce stores that have done this. Like how many of you have visited like, oh, I might buy this shoe and then you leave without buying it. And then all of a sudden you're literally seeing that shoe everywhere. Like you see ads all over the place for this shoe or this jacket or whatever it was, right? Well, that's warm traffic. They're retargeting you. Like they want you to come back and perform an action. Some of these ads that HubSpot has on here might be cold traffic ads, like to people that have never seen HubSpot before or visited their website. But a lot of their ads are probably like warm traffic ads. Like, look, bro, you visited we our know website. You're looking for this. <laughs> you didn't sign up for it. We're just going to blast you with ads for the next 90 days until you decide to come back and sign up for our products. Like, so just keep that in mind. But this is a great tool to go look at your competitors' ads. And it is one of the first things that we have founders do to get inspiration is to go look and see what they're doing. So whether it's and, uh, good or bad. Yeah, Alvinius actually gives some support to your confidence in that HubSpot's a B2B company and they're running ads all over and Facebook. And they're running ad, tons so, of yeah. ads on Facebook. Yeah, um, and I would say yeah that's a good point. One approach that we get a lot for people in the B2B space and where you've probably seen a decade worth of innovation is most B2B companies go to market strategy is not selling directly to the business. It's usually selling to employees inside the business right. for cheap or free. And then later on having an enterprise thing like Slack is a great example, right? Slack grows like mint inside an organization. Somebody starts using it for free. They're collaborating on it. And then all of a sudden they're selling their boss on it six months later because they want the connectivity. They want, you know, the bigger things. They want the searchable log. They want the history. They want all the enterprise features. And now right. it becomes a B2B decision. And that's an extremely popular um, model and you can advertise towards it. I mean, look at all these like monday.com is running ads. QuickBook is, QuickBooks is running ads on Facebook. Like just think like if you don't think you can run B2B on Facebook or Instagram, like you're probably wrong because you know, the benefit of doing it is that other people aren't doing it. So yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like very much less competitive, you know? Uh, so anyway, uh, just keep that in mind. You know? Yeah. All right. I think, I think we can wrap um, uh, so that we don't, cause we're clearly running into cool. other people's calendar schedules, but I know. <laughs> anybody who hasn't heard. Um, Sorry, everybody. <laughs> no, no, this, I, I always like, we, I plan to go along on this one, Jake, because you and I can't shut up and we can't I know. slow down. I'm so I bad apologize. at not talking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologize to the international people in our audience who uh, <laughs> might speak English as a second language. It is difficult for us to rein ourselves in. Um, but we will send out a recording to this later tonight, as well as resources and that link to get the, the refundable uh, thing for this weekend. If you can make it, that's awesome. Yeah. It sounds like there's a lot of interest. So that's really exciting to hear. Cool. And a bunch of other things. More programming is coming. We'll be Jack Jake back much sooner uh we won't wait another six months yes and anything else any <laughs> no, that's it. thank you guys so much like good luck thank on everything you. you guys do a ton of respect for entrepreneurs so whatever you're building uh keep crushing it so yes awesome and you can also know jake and i are both on the east coast because the sun is about to set <laughs> even yes. the, even the lights and i've noticed it start to get dim but thank you all savings time <laughs> yeah oh man it sucks uh, see us again. Check out the rest of our series. I'll also put links to the rest of the series we're doing. Logan and uh, um, Stephen, who are the forecaster guys, who's like the next yeah. chapter. Um, and they integrate really well with Jake and I's offerings and the whole thing. If you're a Gus Launch Company, you're basically like all three stars. Uh, hopefully you're, cool. we love entrepreneurs and we're hopefully helping uh, make more successful ones from any walk of life. So thanks again, Jake. Have a great evening. Uh, everybody. See ya.